بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى We thank Him for everything that He has bestowed upon us We ask Him to send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم His entire household, all his companions May Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless them all And may Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless every single one of us and grant us goodness we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us in these beautiful eves of Ramadan. Remember, it is not how you started the month. It is actually how you end the month that holds more value. Any deed you do, how you start it, yes, it's important. But if you have ended it in the correct way, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the condition upon which you will be judged. It is the ending. If a person spent the beginning of Ramadan in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the end of it in the disobedience of Allah, he has lost. But if a person has become more serious in the end of Ramadan, then by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will be from among those who have earned the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has indeed revealed so many verses connected to his mercy. One such verse was a verse that I mentioned two days back and I remember saying it is the verse that has in it the greatest hope from all the verses in the Quran. And an error was that I said verse number 150 of Surat Az-Zumar. If you were to look at Surat Az-Zumar, it does not have 150 verses. So that was just a human error. It was actually verse number 53 of Surat Az-Zumar. I thought perhaps I'd start off by clarifying this and as you know, we're all human beings. We can slip up in that regard. And I'm sure those of you who have been following closely would have probably picked up that it's just human error. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. The beauty is I recited the verse. So it's quite easy to go back and to look for it and to ensure that yes, indeed, it is in Surah Al-Zumar. In fact, it is verse number 53 of that surah. We move on to Surah Al-Hujurat. Al-Hujurat named after the rooms the dwelling of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there is a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has named the surah Al-Hujurat or it is named Al-Hujurat. Because there was a time when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in his rooms and there was a group of people who had come and they wanted to see him and they were impatient. They did not wait. They started yelling and screaming and they started calling out his name, which was quite disrespectful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verse number four of that beautiful surah. And this is a narration in At-Tabarani, narration of Zayd ibn Arqam radiallahu an. He says these people came, they started calling out impatiently the name of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the back of all the rooms, which means they did not wait. Normally you knock and you wait, like we said a few days back. So Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُنَادُونَكَ مِنْ وَرَاءِ الْحُجُرَاتِ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ صَبَرُوا حَتَّى تَخْرُجَ إِلَيْهِمْ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ Those who call out, those who call you from behind the rooms, they are actually, many of them are not sensible. Many of them are not thinking correctly. That's the wrong way of doing things. Allah says, had they borne a little bit of patience, had they bore a little bit of patience, <coughs> until you came out and emerged, it would have been better for them. I think what we learn from this is that when we would like to call someone, we need to use a respectable term to refer to them, number one. And number two is if you arrive at someone's home, there is a proper way of doing things. 
You know, if someone were to arrive, for example, in your driveway, at your gate, and they are to hoot or use the horn of the motor vehicle to the degree that it seems like someone is dying, I think it would irritate everyone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. You ring the bell, you push it once, you wait. Perhaps you might want to, after a little time, try again. Or if it is a door, you knock it. And the third time, maybe it is a message to say, we don't want you here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. But if you were to wait for the people to answer the door, perhaps it would be better for you. It would be better for me. These are etiquettes. And if you look at verse number two of that surah, the very opening verses, a tafsir of at tabari narrated by Qatada. He says that people used to raise their voice when it comes to, when it comes to addressing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, raising their voice and at times also yelling, screaming. You know, when I am speaking to you, for example, I try to raise my voice in a way that you can hear. Also in a way that I'm not distracted by the sounds that might be on the sides. Because if I am speaking too low, perhaps a child who's making a noise to my right, for example, might disturb me. But if I were to raise my voice a little bit, I won't even notice what's going on. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us all. These etiquettes are made mention of in the Quran. If you look at the Quran, we recite it in Salah. Yes, indeed, we do have children behind us and it is a sunnah to tolerate the children that are behind us. But it does not give a green light to the mothers to say, you know what, it's okay. Let my child yell as much as they can. It's fine because it's a sunnah. No way, not at all. My mother, if you know that your child is making such a noise that they are disturbing all the other musallim, it is only correct etiquette for you to take the child away so that you do not disturb the rest. But if it is a cry and a yell, you're about to complete your salah. Perhaps it is something, you know, a noise that is made normal children, uh, perhaps making a little bit of noise here and there. That may not be such a big issue. In fact, it was tolerated by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As I say, we need to strike a balance. We are not saying that we should not be tolerating children. Not at all. We should be. But at the same time, we should not take advantage of that rule. And we should not be from among those who say, it's fine, it's okay, even if they yell at the top of their voices, I do not need to attend to them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us come to our senses. So this is what we learn. Those who were raising their voice with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was considered disrespectful. You did not have to yell. You did not have to raise voice. Imagine if I'm talking to you and I'm yelling at the top of my voice. People would think I'm arguing, I'm fighting, and yet I'm not. All I'm doing is trying to raise your attention. The same applies today. When we speak on the phone, it does not mean because the person happens to be across the continent overseas that we need to yell on the phone. Hello, they can hear you, my brothers, my sisters. They can hear you. You just need to whisper by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this. It's a beautiful narration where people were raising their voices. So Allah says regarding Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in particular. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawti nabi wa la tajharu lahu bil qawl ka jahri ba'dikum li ba'd an tahbat a'malukum wa antum la tashurun O oh, you who believe do not, you, do not raise your voices above the voice of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and don't speak to him aloud as though you are speaking aloud to one another. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, which means no need to raise your voice. We ask Allah to grant us the true etiquette of speech and speaking. We speak clearly in a way that those who need to hear can listen. The irony is some people when they are perhaps in different company with their friends and so on, they yell, they scream, they shout. But when they need to speak to those perhaps indoors, you cannot even hear them. You have to ask them 10 times. Sorry, can you repeat that? Can you say that again? You would never believe that the same person can actually scream at the top of their voices. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a balance. Then we have verse number nine of Surah Al-Hujurat. Also a very important lesson for us all. A hadith muttafaqun alayh narrated by Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. He says, the Prophet ﷺ was once asked by some of his companions to go to Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul in order to sort something out. And so the Prophet ﷺ decided to ride on a donkey and went to see Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Who was the man? He was the chief of the hypocrites 
from among the people of Medina Munawwara, pretending to be a Muslim, and yet he was hiding the fact that he hated Islam and the Muslims. So when the Prophet wasallam went to Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul with this donkey, so as the donkey came near, this man says, move away from me. The smell of your donkey is disturbing me. Now this was quite disrespectful because he was trying to insult. He could not insult Muhammad sallallahu So he is trying to say the smell of the donkey is offensive. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala definitely protects Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this man could never ever have done anything to spoil the reputation or tarnish the image of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rather, one of the companions responded. And you know what he says? He says, Wallahi, the scent or the smell of the donkey is better than your smell. Now that's obviously a response just to tell him, hey, keep quiet. You dare utter these words. Because he is saying the smell of the donkey is disturbing and the Sahabi immediately pounced on him and he says, Wallahi, it is a sweeter smell than yours. So that caused a problem because this man also had supporters. One of his supporters from among the believers who was from his tribe got up and began to yell at this companion and a few of the other companions came to the defense of this one. Radiallahu anhum jami'an. May Allah's blessings and peace be upon all of them. May Allah be pleased with them all and with us as well. So it ended in a, in a fight. Literally one hit the other and the other hit this one. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses to clarify that this should not be the case with the believers. Verse number nine. When two groups of believers are fighting each other, then it is the duty of the rest to make peace between them. One might ask, well, there was a hypocrite on one side. The hypocrite was not involved in the fighting. It was the believers who were involved. The hypocrite was only a catalyst. And this is the habit of the hypocrites. My brothers and sisters, listen carefully. They want you and I to fight. So what they do, they come and start the war and then they move back. They move away and they're not involved. And you are fighting with me. I am fighting with you. And I don't even realize the one who kindled that was actually a hypocrite who is now sitting and laughing at what we are doing. This is something that is really the quality of those who do not fear Allah. They start a war between people who really don't have a problem among themselves. This is why be careful. Like we said, and we always have said, people are good, but shaitan is very bad. So remember to identify shaitan and to keep him as far as possible. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deeper understanding. So Allah says, if while you are trying to make peace between the two uh, fighting factions of the believers, you find that one of them is the oppressor and he doesn't want to make the peace, he is the oppressor, then you need to fight the oppressor until he comes back to the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse is connected to two who are believing, but they are fighting each other. It's our duty to make peace. And it's a great act of worship. Just like it is a major sin for us to fight amongst each other. It is a major act of worship to make peace between people who might be fighting each other. And they are all believers. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness in our own homes to grant us goodness in our own communities. My brothers and sisters, it's important to note that now during the last few days of Ramadan, when the hearts are meant to be softened and Eid is just round the corner, we need to make peace with our brothers that whom we may not be speaking to. We need to make peace with our sisters, our uncles, our aunts, perhaps our cousins, our relatives, perhaps our community members, members of the Ummah. We need to make peace. And to make peace, a lot of patience is required. Sometimes there is give and take. You might need to, for example, apologize when you know perhaps that this apology might not have been extremely necessary. But to make the peace, we apologize. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a deep understanding. Also, what we learn from this is we should never utter derogatory terms to hurt people. Here, the term was uttered about the, the donkey that was being ridden by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very offensive. Sometimes we offend one another because we comment about someone 
and their clothing and perhaps their motor vehicle and their house and their home and something of theirs, maybe their job and so on. Remember, the, we all have feelings. Don't hurt these feelings for no reason. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Connected to the same issue of feelings, it is reported in Sunan Abi Dawood, Sunan Al-Tirmidhi, Sunan Al-Nasai, Sunan Ibn Majah, Hadith of Abi Jabira. He says that there was a time when the people or the Ansar, the people had more than one name. You know, they were called by different names. So I know you as Abdullah, for example, but then perhaps some people might know you as Fatty. Fatty, because you're fat. So what happens is they used to call each other with the name that was detested. And they used to use names that people don't like, you know, Darky, Fatty, whatever else it is. These are nicknames. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses prohibiting that. When it comes to a nickname, it is totally forbidden to use a nickname to refer to someone that that person does not like. If they like it, no problem. You know, mashallah, you can call them cutie pie or whatever else it is by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they like it, there is no problem. Sometimes it might even be obviously between the right people. Here we're talking of a spouse by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a child. If you're using a beautiful name that they love and they would like you to call them by, it can become an act of worship because, for example, if that is your spouse, it's the sunnah of Muhammad to use a loving term. The Prophet used to call uh, Aisha radiallahu anha with the term Humaira. Humaira referring to the pink cheeks that she used to develop, the blushing that she had. You know, for example, someone would call uh, a person who blushes a lot referring to their rosy cheeks as a person perhaps who is maybe rosy cheeks so if they like that name and if it is good yes there is nothing wrong with it but the minute we use derogatory terms listen to what Allah says verse number 11 of Surah Al-Hujurat Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la yaskhar qawmun min qawmin asa an Allah says, O oh, you who believe, do not mock at one another, lest some are better than others. And even women, they should not mock at one another lest some are better than others. And Allah continues to say, وَلَا تَلْمِزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not insult yourselves. How would you insult yourself? By insulting others. You insult someone. There is a hadith which says, one of the worst people is he who insults his own parents. So the Prophet ﷺ was asked, how can a person insult his own parents? So he said, do you see a man insulting the parents of another? So that one then insults his parents. He's the one who asked for it. So by me insulting the mother or the father of someone else, I am asking them to insult my mother and father. I'd rather abstain from it and I don't want to do it. So don't insult yourselves. And do not call each other with offensive nicknames. Never use an offensive nickname to refer to another person, no matter who they are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings and make us more conscious of this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to use the best of names to refer to people. In fact, it is also good to use the full name to refer to someone. If someone's name, for example, and I'm giving you an example of a long name. Say, for example, it is Abdul Aziz. To call them something shorter than that would actually not be ideal. You should call them the proper full name. And if you want to use a nickname that they love or they don't mind, then it's okay. If not, call them with their full name. Don't, you know, chop the name up because sometimes it has the name of Allah in it and you've just deleted it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Then we have a narration mentioned by Al-Wahidi the narration of Muqatil, he says that at the time of the victory of Makkah, you and I know that the chiefs of Quraysh, some of them had accepted Islam, such as Abu Sufyan and the likes, and some had still not accepted Islam. And it was time for prayer. And the Prophet ﷺ chose from amongst his companions, Bilal ibn Rabah, 
who was a dark skinned man from Africa to climb on top of the Kaaba, which means the rooftop of the Kaaba and to call out the Adhan, the call to prayer. He says, Oh Bilal, you go and you call out that call. So Bilal ibn Rabah, who used to be a slave of some of these people, when he climbed and he went on top and he was calling out the people to prayer, some of the kuffar of Quraysh and some of those who were weak, who had less knowledge, who were not really filled with Iman, they uttered a term that was derogatory. Do you know what they said? We wish we'd have died before we saw this day. Look at this dark skinned man standing here, being given the honor. How can this have been the case? How can this be allowed? How can he be a man who's calling to prayer? He's calling the others to prayer. And yet he's a man who's dark skinned. And immediately, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised the status of Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu an. And if you sit and think about it, he was carefully selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be among the people of Quraysh and later on to go to Medina in Hijrah and later on to come back and to achieve this virtue. Had there been no people who were dark skinned at the time, where would we have ever learned the virtue of those who have dark skin? Or where would we have learned that skin does not mean anything at all. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created us with different skins from different races and so on for a purpose. So let's listen to this purpose. Allah revealed verse number 13 of Surah Al-Hujurat to clarify this and to make it very clear that we come from one source. And the reason why Allah has separated us or created us differently, Allah makes mention of it. Ya ayyuha nasu inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu inna akramakum inda Allahi atqakum inna Allah alimun khabir O oh, you who believe in the, or should I say, oh man, Allah doesn't use the term, oh you who believe here. He says, oh man, because this is a lesson for all mankind. Oh mankind, I have created you from a single male and a single female, which means you are all belonging to one father and one mother. One father, one mother, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to understand that. Allah says, we have made you into peoples and nations in order that you recognize one another so that you can know one another. That's the reason why we made you different. But you need to know that the most pious from amongst you or the most honored from amongst you is the one who has the greatest consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah knows best. Man doesn't know. Who knows who is more pious? It is actually Allah who knows that. We will get the result of it on the day of judgment. When Allah gives it to us and says, you know what? You were better than the others because you were closer than me. For now, it's a struggle for everyone. Now, one might ask, so this difference in order to get to know each other, how does it work? Very simple. We don't think. Today we are seated here, perhaps, mashallah, in our thousands, I think. If you take a careful look, Every single person is recognizable by their looks because Allah made you unique and different. Imagine if we were all looking the same. Allah is telling you, I made everybody different so you can recognize each other. So I know you because your name is Muhammad. The other one is Abdullah. The other one is Saeed. The other one is Ismail. The other one is Arif. The other one is Bashir. We know them because of their faces. Had it not been for these faces, we would have not recognized them. We would have had numbers. Take a look at the motor vehicles. Each one has a number plate. Why? Because the Toyotas look alike. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So Allah is saying, look, some are tall, some are short, some are a little bit on the, you know, should I say, mashallah, bigger. We don't want to use the derogatory term. Some are a little bit slimmer, mashallah. Some are muscular, some are perhaps, you know, slim and so on. Uh, all this is from Allah. Some are dark skinned, some are slightly lighter in complexion. Allah says, it's only for you to recognize one another, to make it interesting. You live on earth, you say, oh, mashallah, you know, subhanallah, because you look at so many people who are all different and that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So remember this, 
Racism is totally prohibited. It's something that Islam disallows. Today we are seated here. We've got all sorts of colors, shapes and sizes, mashallah. And everyone is free to sit wherever they want. It's the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are brothers and sisters in faith. Nobody can say, okay, because my skin is a little bit perhaps darker or lighter, I am more entitled to do X, Y, and Z. Absolutely not. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who do not feel superior to others simply based on perhaps where we come from, perhaps the, the color of our skin, perhaps sometimes even the village we come from. We have a habit where we believe we are better. We are better than everybody else. That's it. It's my little village that is there in one corner tucked away and the mangoes we ate were a little bit more yellow than the mangoes on the other side. Wallahi, this is a disease. It is a disease. And if you think about it, I think I've hit it on the, on the head because it's a fact. A lot of us, and if we look at our hearts, even our fathers and our forefathers, they feel that we are better just because we come from a certain village or a certain area. Wallahi, you are not. That is exact jahiliya. The kuffar of Quraysh used to feel exactly the same. And Allah revealed these verses to clarify that. Let's be passionate about this and let's take it out of our hearts. And let's understand we are all from Adam and Adam is from the dust. And we are going to be returning to that dust. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and protect us from racism. Sometimes that creeps in without us even realizing that we've become racist. Ameen. So my brothers and sisters, after that passionate message, we move on to Surat Qaf. Surat Qaf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies a statement made by the people of the book. Some of the Jewish people said, and this is a narration made mention of in Al Mustadrak of Al Imam Hakim, narration of Ibn Abbas. Anhu. He says, They said, when they asked Muhammad وسلم, a question about the creation of entire creation, and he explained that Allah created the earth and the heavens in six days, and they said, Well, he rested on the seventh day. So Muhammad وسلم, was upset. Allah, the Lord of the worlds, does not get tired, he doesn't rest. And Allah clarifies this verse number 38 of Surah Qaf. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامِ وَمَا مَسَّنَا مِنْ لُغُوبِ فَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا يَقُولُونَ Indeed, we have created the skies or the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them in six days. And we did not get tired at all. So bear patience regarding what they are saying. They are saying Allah got tired or Allah needed a rest or that Allah rested on the seventh day. Allah says that's not true. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. Then we move on to Surah Al-Dhariyat, a beautiful Surah. They used to say to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because people used to listen to him, because those who listened to him accepted his message in most cases, because the Quran was so powerful that people memorized it so quickly, even the children used to read it. The people of Quraysh used to say, this man is a magician and he's a madman. This man is a magician and he's a madman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses number 54, 55 of Surah Al-Dhariyat telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to ignore those statements. Don't worry, just ignore them. You know, leave them, leave those people. Sometimes we get so worried about what people are saying about us that we become depressed, whereas to be honest, you can never stop the tongues of people. They will continue wagging. That's their job. Allahu Akbar. You make sure that you ignore manyo. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. If someone wants to utter dirty words, ignore it. These words are full of a stench. They are full of a, a foul smell. Why do we want these words to depress us when we know they are untrue? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not a magician. He was not a madman. He was so concerned. These people are uttering words against me. Allah says, Leave them, you know, ignore them in this regard. Leave them. For indeed, you are not blameworthy if you were to do so. Now, this does not mean stop giving them the good message. No, it means leave them in this particular matter. This is something that you are not blameworthy. If you were to ignore people when they utter bad words and you just carry on, you are definitely not blameworthy. That's the way forward, my brothers and sisters. Sometimes you just need to ignore. Sometimes people do not want a response from you. 
Their intention is to insult you. You must be able to distinguish. If a person wants to clarify something with you, they will come to you with utmost respect to say, you know, my brother or my sister, this is a little misunderstanding I have. I'd like to know what's going on. These are genuine people. But when people want to hurl abuse and insult and make a public scene of that, you must know their intention is to insult. You walk away as per the instruction of this verse in a beautiful manner. You will still sleep, inshallah, in a beautiful manner as well. But if we are to be worried, concerned, we want to respond as you reply, they, they are happy because you've given them ammunition now. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep lesson. So then some of the believers, when they heard this, that Allah is telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to leave them, to turn away, they thought for a moment that perhaps we are at a loss because yes, these verses were revealed for the mushrikeen. But you know, when the mu'minin are worried, they normally think to themselves, if Allah is telling him to turn away, he might be asking them, asking him to turn away from us. And immediately the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies this. And remind, continue reminding, for indeed the reminder will definitely benefit those who are true believers. So they were now happy to say, no, he will carry on reminding us. He will continue calling us towards goodness. Now I want to pause for a moment. Listen to that verse. Allah says, continue reminding for indeed the reminding will benefit those who truly believe. Ask yourselves. And the question is for myself as well. When you are corrected or reminded, do you feel bad about it? If the answer is yes, then there is something wrong with your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're a true believer, the reminder will help you. And the more you are reminded, the more it will help you. Subhanallah. When people tell you once, twice, 10 times, you're actually a person who thinks about it. Even if that person happens to be your own child and they say, dad, I don't like this to happen. You know, I want to stop for a minute and let you know of something that is really terrible. Many of the children grow, grow up looking at their parents as their role models. It's something given from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I have had so many cases of people or young, you know, young adults who are growing up, adolescent and so on, and they find immorality. They find a lot of unacceptable messages and images and videos in the phones of their mothers or fathers. And they become so depressed, they don't know how to deal with it. They find dad has a girlfriend or mom has a boyfriend and they're doing something totally haram. They're meeting up for a haram relationship. And the child is reaching out to people like myself, for example, saying, you know, we need help. I don't know. I feel like killing myself because I can't believe my father's doing this. I don't know. I looked up to him my entire life. And now I've seen something that is so shocking. My beloved mothers and fathers who are here for the sake of Allah, cut it, quit it. Your children are suffering. They know what's going on. They're not fools and they cannot handle it. They looked at you as a role model. They looked at you as a person who is supposed to be leading them to the path of purity. And we are leading them down a path of dirt. May Allah forgive us. May Allah grant us the ability to change our ways. Some of the children don't know how to address it. When I say, for example, that, you know, you need to have a heart to heart with dad. They say, I can't do that. I just can't. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. I know perhaps we just, you know, spoke on the topic of reminding. And this is a reminder. This is definitely a reminder to cut our ways and habits. It's the month of Ramadan. Let us live up to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants as best as we can. Remember my brothers and sisters, the day we die, we will tell ourselves these 60 years, 70 years that I lived, it was a waste of time engaging in sin. What did I benefit from it? Here I am dead. I'm now facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've got a stack of sins on my back. What was that for? So Allah gives you an eve like this one where he teaches you a prayer. Allahumma inna ka'afuun tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anni. Oh Allah, you are most loving. You love to forgive. So forgive me. May Allah forgive us all and grant us a new beginning. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi bihamdihi subhanaka Allahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.